All right, in section 2.2, we're going to talk about the evolution of atomic theory, kind of how we move from the early ideas in the first video from chapter two to more of the understanding that we have today. And as we move through this section, the key ideas that you should take away are just kind of the, not the details of what's going on, but knowing for every subatomic particle, where did it come from? Okay. So you'll see what I mean by that in just a minute, because we're going to touch on some important experiments that led to this evolution of atomic theory. They've all occurred, right, in the last 200 years and change since we got the five postulates of Dalton's atomic theory. They have led us to the understanding of protons, neutrons, electrons, and isotopes. These subatomic particles, those are called, that atoms are composed of, because we know now there are, in fact, things that are smaller than atoms. And the first thing that was discovered in answering the question definitively that there was something smaller than the atom were electrons. Okay? And electrons came from J.J. Thompson and his cathode ray tube experiments. Cathode ray tube or a CRT, you may have heard of these in old types of televisions. So a cathode ray, we've got a diagram of one on the next slide here, right? It consists of a sealed glass tube, a vacuum, okay, meaning all the air has been removed, with two metal electrodes. Thompson applied a voltage across the electrodes, and, and then we saw a beam that was called a cathode ray, hence cathode ray tube, between the two electrodes, one positive electrode, one negative electrode. Right? And he used a variety of metals to make these electrodes. Didn't matter what he used, different atoms that were in there, these electrodes, right? but a beam always went toward the positive charge and away from the negative charge. Okay. And Thompson did some calculations to figure out that we did in fact have some subatomic particles. Okay. Something with a charge to mass ratio that was much lighter than an atom. Okay. And here's a picture of Thompson in his cathode ray tube, a diagram explaining exactly what went on there. Okay. So we knew we had something smaller than an atom. Okay. And here's a summary of Thompson's results, right? We knew that the electrons, which weren't even called electrons yet, he was calling them cathode ray particles, were lighter than atoms. Okay? They had a negative charge, and it didn't matter what type of metal, what type of atom they came from. Regardless of the source material, these particles were the same. Okay? So that combined with the Millikan oil drop experiment that we have next to give us the idea of electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. You heard me use this term already, subatomic particles with masses less than a thousand times that of an atom. Okay. So we now know that atoms are not, in fact, indivisible. We have smaller subatomic particles. Thompson's work combined with the Millikan oil drop experiment okay, later on, and what Robert Millikan did was create microscopic oil droplets, which he made electrically charged, and he was able to, right, instead of having them drop with the force of gravity, he could slow the rate of the drop or even reverse it by applying an electric field. And this was important because it allowed him to determine the charge on these drops, which was always a multiple of the same value. Here we see a diagram of the experiment on slide 20. And notice these ratios over here. So he knew that the oil drop was always the multiple of a specific charge. Right? There's our actual charge there, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, that capital C is coulombs. Right? So he concluded that, okay, that must be the charge of a single electron. And because he knew the charge, and Thompson had already showed the charge to mass ratio, that allowed us to determine the mass of an electron, right? Which is over here, almost insignificant, right? Not an appreciable amount of mass, these electrons. 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So that gave us the electron. Okay? But what about the rest of the subatomic particles? Well, next came some proposals about what the atom must be. Okay? We had the Thompson plum pudding model which we know is not very good. And then this one that maybe you've seen before, okay? The planetary model of the atom, okay? Which also is not correct, but is a little bit closer than the plum pudding model. 
but it was clear that we needed some more information. Okay. So what came next? Next was the discovery of the nucleus itself, okay, which is in the center of every atom. And the discovery of the nucleus came from Ernest Rutherford and his gold foil experiment. And effectively, what Rutherford did was use nuclear decay to get alpha particles, okay, which he then shot at a very thin piece of gold foil. Okay. And these alpha particles are positively charged. And most of them went through this piece of gold foil undisturbed. But some of them were diver diverted, right? They kind of scattered off. They're, they deflected which mean, must mean that there was another positive charge nearby. Or some of them were completely deflected back towards where this beam was coming from, meaning they hit the nucleus. So the scattering of those alpha particles was gathered using a screen that would glow when they were hit with the scattered alpha particles, looks like this, right? And these are the ones that are diverted or deflected that led to the discovery of the nucleus. Again, most went through, but some of them were coming back, right? And this was significant because the scope, oops, sorry, jump slides there. The scope of this experiment is like shooting cannonballs at a volleyball net. Right? The fact that some of them are scattering back was a big discovery. And that gave us both the nucleus and the positive charge gave us the idea of the proton. Okay? So because most of them were going through undisturbed, Rutherford figured out that most of the volume of atoms is actually empty space. But in the middle is a small, relatively heavy, positively charged body. So most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus, and the nucleus is positively charged. Okay. The electrons, which we knew were negatively charged, must surround the nucleus. Okay. So the positive charge in the nucleus must now come from the proton a positively charged subatomic particle that has an appreciable mass because we know most of the mass is in the nucleus. And here's another diagram showing what's going on there, right? Most going through directly, some being diverted from the positive charge, some actually hitting the nucleus and being deflected completely. So Rutherford and Millikan gave us the electron, sorry, Thompson and Millikan gave us the electron, Got excited here. Rutherford gave us the proton and nucleus. So what was left? Well, we had isotopes that were first figured out from Frederick Soddy, who won the Nobel Prize for that work in 1921. We'll talk about isotopes more later on in this chapter. There are things that have the same chemical identity. They're the same element, same number of protons, but they have different masses because they have different number of neutrons. And the discovery of neutrons actually came last because these things don't have a charge. They're a lot harder to isolate and identify. Okay. Ne neutrons are uncharged subatomic particles, mass, give or take the same of protons, and they were discovered by James Chadwick in 1932. And they are also in the nucleus. Okay. So no Rutherford, that's a huge one. Gold foil gave us nucleus and protons and electrons came from the cathode ray tube and the Millikan oil drop experiment. Summarized, right, in addition to knowing where they came from, you should know this information from 2.2. Okay, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons surround the nucleus. Protons and neutrons have appreciable mass, electrons do not. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral, right, they have no charge, and electrons are negatively charged. And we will use that information moving forward to build our understanding of chemical identities and chemical symbols in our next video.